But isn't it kind of fascinating that we still give a country that is somehow able to miraculously provide universal health care in a sustainable way to its citizens, we still give that country $3 billion a year in direct foreign aid. We just approved a $38 billion defense package for Israel. Now, why would they need that money if they had somehow miraculously found a way to take care of their citizens? <laughs> getting to a very key point where we're talking about the politics of it all. Yes. And historically, I want to point fingers, the Republicans have been against universal health care, single payer, and so forth. Why is it we can't get past the politics and do what's right? Worry about what's right and wrong as opposed to right and left. Historically, Democrats have been against it. It's they wanted That's to do it. not true. If they wanted, the Democrats controlled the presidency and Congress in 2009, 2010. They devised a very big package. It's called Obamacare. You can debate the merits or demerits of it. If you want to advocate for universal care, fine. If you think a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress. If I could jump in, I think you have a Democratic governor and a Democratic and a Democratic legislature. Last I looked here in California, and you seem to have had some problems going to full single payer. I'm not even. I'm sort of agnostic on the right way to do it. I think Israel has an admirable system. It's, but getting from here to there, given the history of this country, the insurance companies' roles, the work of the employer provided health The corruption, insurance. the profit-driven model. <laughs> Possibly. Why are we paying so much more in pharmaceutical drugs than any other country in the world? Why are we paying more for pharmaceuticals? We pay about $1,500 a year per $1,500 a year for pharmaceutical drugs per person in the United States. You, what you go to other countries, let me finish my point. You go to other countries, they spend a, a, a third of that. They spend about $500 per person well, per year agree. on pharmaceutical drugs. I'm not going to let you guys, since you guys want to talk so much, I'm going to let you talk. And it's because we're not allowed we're to negotiate drug prices. Well, let me turn back to talk to the insurance company. We have a huge number of, of life-saving and, 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 and life-enhancing drugs in, these, in this country. In some respects, the rest of the world is a bit of a free rider on us. That's not a bad thing. We're wealthier than the rest of the world, and I think we should contribute this, in a sense, as a public good. But I'm very open to these reforms. I just think you have to be serious about reforms. They're complicated. You want good people to go, talented people to become physicians, which means you want to think about reimbursement and life chances and opportunities for physicians. You want to develop drugs. That's really important, which means you have to have incentives to do it. So it's comp you have insurance companies. I would be very open to going to a different system. There's a huge infrastructure, as the Obama administration of course discovered, here, which you have to work with. People kind of like their employer-provided care, or insurance rather. I could argue that that's not the best way. I would argue that's not the best way to provide insurance, but getting from here to there. John McCain in 2008 was pro proposed a radical move away from employer-provided insurance, and he got pummeled on it by candidate Obama. You're going to take away everyone's employer-provided insurance, which most people like rather well. So it's a very difficult political issue to grapple with. I mean, that would be the one. That's my only caution to everyone who's an enthusiastic reformer. I'm all for reforms. But you do need to think through the politics of it. And these are people who are not simply motivated by greed or selfishness or anything. These are people who have jobs, who, have, who work in hospitals, who are primary care physicians, who work at drug companies, who work at the University of at UCLA and develop drugs. And they all have, they're doing their best, most of them. And they have stakes in the current system. And that's not unreasonable. They've invested a lot in the current system. And it's just, just hard to make those reforms. Why Why is is this? How do we remove the profit incentive from drug manufacturers and, and, and uh, hospitals and so forth so we can just put well, care? Should, can I ask a question? Should sure. you remove the profit incentive? Are you going to get us good drugs if no one can profit? Let me George? Yeah. Then then we Adam. spend $3 trillion dollars on health care in this country. And we leave many people uninsured and many more people underinsured. And any other country could buy that much care and better care for two trillion. We are literally that much worse than the rest of the world. We buy care incredibly badly. We don't buy team care. We don't buy coordinated care. We don't have any kind of internal price competition on major areas of care. And if we actually reorganize care in a patient-centered way, we could literally do it for a couple trillion dollars. We're spending three trillion dollars. What is the estimate on what it would cost to have Medicare for all so-called 
the estimate fee, what it would cost the country? My estimate is we can do it for less than the three trillion easily. Medicare for all? Oh yeah, Medicare for all. I, I <laughs> Like Israel, do you like Germany's model? Germany's yes. model, I, I like Israel's model. A okay, more so, so let's talk about because Germany has. A, we've always, as physicians, we've always looked at Germany as a good, a good model. Do you know what percentage of the employer contribution and the employee's mm -hmm. salary goes into it? Yes, I do. What is that? Uh, it's certainly higher than what we pay here yeah, in the United States. You pay States. nearly a fifth of mm -hmm. all your earnings into your health care. Mm -hmm. But you don't I'm have not, to deal with co-pays. You don't have to deal with premiums. I'm you don't sure. have to deal with the confusion of in-network, out-of-network. Right, that's correct. Right? So, so all the complexity is gone. You don't have to worry about administrative costs. No you don't argument. have to worry about the bureaucracy if you're you deal with today. That's right. But that's how much of our earnings is. currently go to private insurance companies in the form of premiums, deductibles, co-pays, additional co-pays when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs? And speaking of which, I, I can't let this go. I just want to quickly answer the question of why it is that pharmaceutical companies develop drugs here in the United States. No one ever talks about the federal government and its investment in the research of pharmaceutical drugs here in the United States. That is precisely the reason why these companies develop drugs of here. Uh, as far as developing them here? No, 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 not a conflict of interest. So the argument is, look, we don't have our prices for pharmaceutical drugs are not as low as other countries because we want to give these pharmaceutical companies an incentive to develop the drugs here in the United States, to be based here in the United States. The reason why they're based here in the United States is because the federal government subsidizes their research, gives them money to do the research necessary to develop these drugs. I mean, look, the federal government is, of course, flawed, but it never gets credit for how it invests in the innovation, whether it's in the tech sector or whether it's in the pharmaceutical industry. And so this argument of, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't negotiate drug prices because if we do, then they won't be here anymore. They won't be developing them here anymore. That is not true. We do invest in them. And I, I find it incredibly shady that we give them these insane patents Europe. so we will, won't have a more affordable option. Let, let me jump in there. I have a specific question. I see these conversations up here and not necessarily on their level. Uh, I have a producer, his name is Tawala Sharp, who's here. He's a double organ transplant recipient. Um, he was just in the hospital two weeks ago for being diagnosed. Twelve, where are you? Okay. He, uh, he was just trying to get diagnosed for pneumonia. Without his health care coverage, we estimated for a two-week stay at Cedar sinai it was going to be more than $250,000. Well, that is the reality of what we're dealing with. How do we get to a place where it's at least reasonable? Well, every country in Europe uses a, a payroll tax. It's 15% to 90% payroll tax on every person. Every person has to pay a part of their income. And every country in Europe takes that money and puts it into a voucher and gives it to health plans. There is no single government payer in Europe. There, if you go into Germany, you go to Switzerland, you go to the Netherlands, all of those countries have, I chaired the International Federation of Health Plans for a decade. I know these plans. They exist in every one of those countries. They get a voucher from the government, and they use that voucher to deliver best care, and they compete with each other based on best care. They are all competing health plans in those countries, and they have much better drug prices. So it's not government run per se. They have it's much not better run. No, it's a, it's a market. It's a market. But if you're willing to put in 20 percent of your your, your earnings 15, every year, 15, well, 15, 15 in Switzerland, 15 in the Netherlands, 19 in Germany. I don't know what France is. It's but close to 20 percent. Well, really uh, but, but, but yes, you put in. Crystal, what's in our problem? country, we put in ten thousand. If you're ready to do that, don't we, we put in ten thousand today. Now that's three trillion. Is ten thousand bucks per person? That's way more than that number. What about the same we can, number? We spend about 19, 89 percent of our GDP on healthcare. So it may turn out that that's what it costs to afford to be able to provide double organ transplants, which is not a cheap thing. I mean, it's easy to demagogue healthcare, but let's also pay some respect. I agree, incidentally, to the government contribution as well as to the private sector contribution. You know, my brother-in-law works at Sloan Kettering. They get a lot of government money. They also have, are, have very promising advances in cancer therapy, and that's expensive no matter who pays for it at the end of the day. And I, I am more concerned about the quality of health care and improvements of health care. Everyone should have access to health insurance. Everyone should have access to health care. We can debate how to do that, and there's federalism issues. And Everyone. Issues. Europe has Everyone. better quality 
Do you yeah, have everyone does have access. The question but is, Europe has better quality. Access and affordability are two different things. Oh, I agree with that. Wait, I agree so, with that. So, so the question then is, how to subsidize people who can't afford it? And this is something the Obama administration struggled with, and they had one way of subsidizing it. McCain had a different proposal. Conservatives have typically preferred tax credits. Uh, others have proposed various exchanges and so forth. But you know, you don't want to. But we do want to have everyone have access to insurance. A, B, everyone to have access to actual health care, which is a different issue than the financing of health care. And I just would again not neglect the actual quality of health care and the improvements that we can have, which God knows we've benefited from over the last decades in this country and around the world, and which many, many other people in Africa and in much less developed countries have benefited from hugely. And that's expensive. And I don't really worry about the expense as much as I do about, I mean, if we can, we can afford to pay for good health care in this country. We need to make sure we, we have incentives for people to continue making improvements in my view. Dr. Drew, why does it have to be real quick? Do you know what it costs to get a drug through the FDA now? Do you understand how that works? Okay, so the moment you pull a molecule off the shelf, the clock begins ticking, right? You have now 15 years to study that, get it through the FDA, and make your profit. And that's it. It's zero after yeah. that because it goes. But it, it takes about five to seven years to get the studies done, to get it through the FDA at the price of, on average, $2 billion, the FDA. And now you've got about six, seven years to get that $2 billion back. Now, right. most drugs are designed in such a way that they can do that, but that's not a great incentive but system, it, and it guarantees high prices. And even with today's high drug prices, that's only 14% of the health care cost. That's only 14%. The rest of that money is going into bad care, too many heart but attacks. What do you mean by bad care? How much, of it's going to physicians? Uh, really, How much of it's going to physician salaries? About 16%. Yeah, so do you it's think physician small, salaries are wildly... Wait no, a second. No, no, no. Is that the issue? The issue is the administrative cost. Let me just make this too. 68% go to physician salaries. Maybe they could get 16%. paid. 16%. 68%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 16%. 
can be improved, and under a Medicare for All system, it would be improved. But even so, well, we'll the support for Medicare, the support for Medicare, if you poll Americans who are, you, who are currently using Medicare, it is a popular program, which is why our uh, uh, politicians don't want to cut it because they know it would be an unpopular thing to do. Uh, Medicare for All, a Reuters poll just indicated that 70% of Americans would support Medicare for All. It's because we're tired of the complexity of the current system. We're tired of having uh, this issue where we don't want to go see the doctor every year for our annual checkup because we're afraid of what we might find. I have back issues. I have a great job. I have a great PPO. You want to know how much, how much I want to go to the doctor to figure out what's going on with my back? Zero percent. Because I don't know what surprise bill I'm going to get. My husband just had shoulder surgery. Again, I have a PPO. All right? Out of pocket, we spent over $3,000 for his shoulder surgery. And so, the, and that's, again, I'm an individual who has excellent private insurance. And you still end up paying that much out of pocket. One of the top reasons why Americans file for bankruptcy is because of medical debt. Okay? <laughs> Costs a lot more than three thousand dollars. If you actually want to know the real cost, and doctor charged forty thousand oh, dollars. I'm sorry. Well, if you want to know the real cost of running a hospital and having trained nurses and having trained physicians and having the expertise to do that, it's and the recuperation and so forth. It's an expensive thing. It's got to be paid for somehow. I'm, and I don't think we kid ourselves that magically passing any one set of reforms, whether it's better compensation for primary care physicians, which might be a good idea, or maybe it's getting rid of the insurance companies and getting rid of employer provided. Uh, health care, which is really a sister, you know, the flip side of the insurance companies, you might say, and going to uh, kind of Germany, Switzerland type plan. I'm totally open to that, but this plan is deeply embedded in our country. It's very hard to change it politically. People like every administration, Democratic and Republican, Clinton found this, and then Bush and McCain found this, and then Obama found this, uh, and Trump's finding this, of course, with the attempt to, to, uh, to repl repeal and replace Obamacare. People are relatively satisfied with their current, they're satisfied enough with this is the political problem. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. People, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. People, people hold on. are satisfied enough. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just back people back. are satisfied enough back with their current health care that it is hard politically to We're change it up. and it's easy to demagogue. Okay. No, you, you, you should because this, this, is is a, a, this is an empirical fact. If you don't believe the polls, if you don't believe your politicians, if you don't believe Democrats or Republicans alike, it is hard to reform health care politically. And it is hard because people are nervous about change. They are mostly reasonably satisfied with Medicare. I very much agree with that, if you ask elderly people. And therefore, that's why cutting Medicare is so unpopular. They're reasonably satisfied, most of them, with their employer-provided plans. And therefore, it's just hard practically to say, trust us, we're going to totally change this, and it's going to work out better. And in fact, people who've tried to make those changes have tended to pay a price politically. Maybe it's admirable that they paid a price. Nancy Pelosi shoved through Obamacare, the Democrats lost the House, but maybe she did the right thing, and once she deserves praise. Maybe McCain deserves praise for trying to reform the employer based system. But it's just, I'm just telling you as an analytical fact. So far, maybe it'll change in 2020. Maybe someone can run on Medicare for all and really change this political dynamic. That's an interesting question. But that has been the dynamic for the last 25 years or so. It's hard to change the system. The things that pay off politically are CHIP and other things which are really incremental reforms in the system. What, what's wrong, George, let me direct this to you. What's wrong with incremental changes and improvements? Pre-existing conditions was an incremental change which improved the, situ uh, the, the system. What other incremental changes might you recommend at this time? Well, what we need to do is have a really clear vision for what we want health care to be. We, we, oh we absolutely, but <laughs> no, but the, well, it's really basic. We, what we need to do is say, we want computer support for the care of every patient. That doesn't we help with the all, care. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. no, you cut the cost by two thirds in many conditions if you have all the information. It's when you're operating. 
out of ignorance about what the patient actually has. You mean digitize all the records? We need, yeah, we need data. You know, primary on care every person there all the time with the patient. There's no nobody. In the it's primary a, it's care a combination of primary care, care protocols, uh, specialties. There's actually intelligence support uh, care delivery. What we need is a vision that we need all the information available for every patient all the time at the point of care when they need it. And we need every patient to have access to primary care in a way that's paid for. And when you make those changes, you can transform care. To find every it's person. Very that we can, and oh, that's we're talking about uh, yeah. every person in America. We computerize okay. everything in this country except care. You think about all the things you buy. You've got information about that, everything. But HIPAA is yeah, HIPAA is a major barrier. Yeah. HIPAA is a huge barrier. HIPAA because HIPAA keeps primary doctors primary. Yeah. from sharing information with each other. So you get patients going from one doctor to another, they but have to take a Xerox of their medical record and carry it to the next site. That's true. And the next site doesn't have a, a place to put it, a framework to put it. And so we can very we can mandate that. We can mandate the existence of electronic medical record in every doctor's office, and we could mandate that those systems all be connected, and care would get better for all of us very, very quickly. So in, in, in the short term, we could improve what we have in an incremental sense. And I, yes. And but as far as making that material change, is that beyond well, our reach? No, no, we can be, then going from there, we actually have the context that we can use to deliver team care to everyone, and we can deliver it for less than the three trillion, and it's gonna be better care. The science of medical care changes every day, it gets better and better, and doctors don't have any access to that science. Nobody is a conduit to most doctors. Right. Like so I, I just, I want to, I really, I really don't want to frame the discussion around incremental change, because I think incremental change is precisely the issue that we keep running into. So could there be small fixes here and there? Yeah, but we experienced that with the Affordable Care Act. Okay, and look, there were some big fixes, including allowing people to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26, getting rid of or, or preventing private insurers from kicking people off of uh, coverage if they have a pre-existing condition. Those were important changes, but they were incremental. It didn't really change uh, the lack of affordability when it came to these, uh, these insurers and these plans. And the price keeps going up every year. Uh, the price controls under the Affordable Care Act wasn't enough, wasn't enough. And so a lot of people are understandably frustrated, upset, angry with the system that we have right now. You know, talking to uh, primary care physicians, uh, one of the issues that they do have is going through the authorization for various treatments or various uh, procedures that they want to do one and having to, deal one with, having to deal with, uh, you know, the private insurers and getting things authorized. Well, by, by getting the way, it's not getting things authorized, it's being told how to take care of the patient. My thing is, if we are so shitty as primary care doctors, send us back some more but training. But no one's saying how that primary care doctors are shitty. They're telling us how to take no care of our patients that. all the time. No, all no the one is saying that. Is when was the last time you practiced? This is a primary for care physician. Yeah, when was the last time you were in a doctor's office and had to really and, and you I'm had to, you had to get your workers to call private Ask insurers and get there. You can, yeah, I can show you on my phone right now. I've got okay. three and authorizations. Right. Come up. But, they're, but in there, they're telling me how. We're going to make sure that you have a chance to get in on this conversation. If you have questions, not speeches, questions, 